When I was around 10 years old, some 25 years ago, my father shouted at me for the first and only time during our time together. I hadn't done anything dangerous or stupid per se. I wasn't being scolded because I'd been disrespectful or snarky. I had not broken, taken or stolen anything without a permission, and I had not lied about something. The catalyst for this aggressive outburst was a video game, Ninja Gaiden, or as we knew it back in the old continent, Shadow Warrior. This game is lauded by many, yours truly included, as one of the greatest classics of the 8-bit console era. One of the best, if not the best, action platformer there is. Tight controls, amazing soundtrack, great gameplay, varied levels, ambitious storytelling, and a great art style. There's a lot to love, but... But... Ninja Gaiden is also filled to the brim with classic 8-bit bullshit that's bound to shave off at least a couple of months from your lifespan. At times, it can be a vile trek to go through. It's a spiteful and vindictive experience that only a handful of games can rival in malice and, honest to god, frustration. The type of experience Dark Souls, Super Meat Boy, Getting Over It and the likes dream of becoming when they grow up. As luck would have it, there are infinite continues, so nothing stops you from bashing your head against this game till the end of all times. Despite the obvious difficulty, I'm quite capable in the game. I'm not excellent by any means, not a speedrunning, no-hit running freak. I'm 10 years old, so I have little to do and lots of time to do it. One day I reach what I presume to be the final boss of the game. And what a final boss it is. The Masked Devil, the right hand of the big bad demon Jakuyo, is revealed to be your presumed dead father. The whole reason for this continent's stretching slaughter was to avenge your dead father, and now he's alive, and you're forced to fight him to the death. The awesome soundtrack kicks in, and... I die instantly without landing a single hit on the boss. Much to my surprise, I find myself not at the start of the boss fight, not at the latest checkpoint, not even at the start of the level, but at the start of the final act. That's three goddamn levels. Were you born in the 80s and started your video gaming journey pre-internet era? You know how a young mind handles these kinds of situations. Games were an open field of cryptic opportunities and rampant theories. My ten-year-old mind draws the only possible conclusion. It is because I didn't land a single hit. I try again, make my way through the three levels, and this time manage to land a couple of hits before succumbing to my inevitable demise. And the game, of course, whisks me back at the start of the act. There was no secret. Of course there wasn't. The good folks at Tecmo were just being snarky. Undeterred from this slight hiccup of having to go through three goddamn levels every time I want to give a shot at the boss, slowly I get better, chipping away more health every try. And let me remind you, this was old school 8-bit hardware Nintendo. No emulation, no level skips, no cheats, no ROM hacks, no save states. Just you and the controller against the evil machine. Finally, with only a sliver of health left, I managed to land the killing blow. This was the hardest, the most monumental achievement I'd ever managed to pull off during my yet short-lived life. With glee, I watched what I presumed to be the ending cutscene. Then the phase two of the boss fight started, the boss killed me in an instant, and sent me back to the beginning of the act. Which brings us back to the beginning of this video, the stoic, usually subtle naval officer shouting in full force for the first time in my life. You see, when I was thrown back yet again, I did what any other ten-year-old would have done. I screamed as loud as I could and threw the controller at the TV. My father snapped and proceeded to scold me of my violent behavior. 
so bewildering and alien to him. And he threatened to take my console away, should it bring forth this type of behavior in me. I panicked. This game had no passwords, no saves, no level skip codes. Where my father to turn off the console now, I'd have to start again from the very beginning. The evening was closing in, I'd already spent most of the day conquering this game, and tomorrow I'd had to go back to my mother's house, Nintendo-less. So I beg and plea, promise to cease my outbursts, tears still running down my face. Not so much really from the shouting, but out of sheer anger, of disappointment towards the game. My father decides to give me a second chance. He sits on his chair, the only one he owns, and lights a cigar. This is how he is engraved into my mind's eye. The ornate wooden chair clad in red velvet, my father sitting on it with his legs crossed, right leg over the left one, book on his right hand, a cigar on his left. The sword-shaped ashtray lies on his left, the drink cart to his right. For the rest of the afternoon, I proceed to bash my head against the brick wall that is the end game of Ninja Gaiden, with my father's keen eye fixated on me, making sure I don't throw anything else on the TV and that I will remain on program as promised. I can't remember how many tries it took me to beat the end boss, Jaguio. I hiss, growl, grunt and writhe at the screen, but I don't throw anything at the screen, and I keep my volume at check, just as I'd promised. For what seems like hours, my father doesn't move from his chair. Books, drinks and cigars are all he needs for entertainment. Later my father brings me dinner next to me on the floor. Grilled cheese with tomato and onions on the side. The one he always makes me. Come bedtime, he brings me a mattress, some blankets and a pillow. He builds me a fort. I beat Jaguar on the first try after my fort upgrade. Hearing my exhilarated glee, my father comes running. He arrives just in time to witness the third phase of the final boss kill me. Three bosses. Three. Never have I ever come up with a game that had three consecutive bosses. Are they allowed to do this? My father, bless his soul, understands the dire nature of the situation and the almost biblical amounts of bullshit his son has gone through this very day. Without saying a word, he brings another mattress, more blankets and pillows, and builds an extension to my fort. My fort has just been upgraded to our fort. He sits next to me, covered up in blankets. He takes me maybe a few more tries to beat the third, and thank God, the final boss of the game. It's hours after my bedtime, and my father is sound asleep inside our fort. Let's stick with my daddy issues for a little while longer. My father had this adage, Elämaan kilvoittelua. Roughly translatable as, life is a competition, or life is a struggle. But neither of these translations managed to grasp the right tone and feel of the phrase. Your standard word for competing is uh, kilpailla. Corporations, media outlets, politicians, athletes, these are the ones who compete. The ones who kilpailevat. But kilvoittelu is an old-timey word and has this weird, semi-religious, spiritual undertone to it. An internal aspect, not present in the more modern Kilpailla. Kilvoittelu brings forth images of stoicism, self-reflection, of taking stock, even self-flagellation. It's a vehemently non-external process of refinement, distillation, of burning away impurities, letting go of unnecessities. There's no crowd, no prize, no accolades, no, Laura for the victor. It's a competition between who you are and who you could be. Now, I've spent most of my adult life trying my hardest not to become my father. But the older I get, the more true Elamount Kilavoittelua rings to me. Challenge, difficulty and adversary are the stones which against we sharpen ourselves, 
Send away that which is no longer useful and necessary. The more marble hits the floor, the greater the statue becomes. And as for this video, difficulty can be a medium of transformation. It can reframe, recontextualize and reinvigorate what type of experience the game and its narrative is. Whether you enjoy difficult games or not, effort is an integral part of the equation. Conquering adversary demands effort. To get something out, you need to put something in. This is the first rule of alchemy and the second law of thermodynamics. Energy can't be created, it can only be transformed. And like all transformations, this too has a cost. It demands a sacrifice. And the sacrificial resource you barter with isn't just effort, it's also time. Time is valuable, perhaps the most valuable resource there is. And a grand sacrifice demands a grand prize in return. When the creeping, burning need for rage quitting crawls into the forefront from the darkest depths of my lizard brain, it's not the insurmountability of the task at hand that bothers me, the cruel and arbitrary nature of my defeat. It's the sudden, crushing doubt of the futility of the effort, the feeling of wasting time, like you'd been lured into a foul deal. When Quaylag AOEs me for the ninth time in a row, or the seventh Northman runs me through in one of Hellblade's many too many gauntlets, or I fail for the twenty-second time in the Temple of Time, it's not just the game that gets under my skin, it's the ticking of the clock. Time is not just valuable, it is finite, perhaps the most finite resource there is. I'm firmly in the camp that believes there's a right way to play a game, to experience it. The opportune mindset, ambiance, pace, setting, difficulty. A Goldilocks zone of your own, just right for you. How you play the game dictates what you get out of it. Some games are easy to get into, some demand the right state of mind and some discipline, effort sacrifice. To receive, you have to give. They won't give up their boons without some coaxing. Difficulty is particularly hard to get right. Too much of it and the frustration breaks the immersion. There's only so much arbitrary torment you can take. You grind, you do meaningless side quests, try to stack the odds at your favor, like a car sticking the skid. You push, jiggle and wave the car around to gather momentum. Exert enough effort, and the car will move, and you can continue your journey. Setbacks are a part of every journey, but they rarely are the moments you look forward to. Not enough friction, and you'll just plow through the experience. You don't engage with the mechanics, you're not gripped, challenged, you just smash square to win. Nothing feels earned, poignant, visceral the embodiment of the narrative breaks. I finished Witcher 3, Horizon Zero Dawn and Metal Gear Solid 5 almost back to back. I had just moved out and was working through a divorce. Between my daughter, work and a new relationship, I had very little time of my own. That occasional small window from 9pm to 10.30 when the flat was silent, my daughter was sound asleep and it didn't matter how much decapitation and nightmarish horrors I filled my living room with. So what happens when you pair this type of routine with games that are by design sprawling, overflowing with content, massive in both their reach and expanse? You rush it. You run through the experience. You draw a straight line from A to B and don't stop to smell the war-torn post-apocalyptic roses. You don't take your time hiking the mountains of Kaer Morhen, sailing the seas of Ardskellig, skulk and shiver in awe through the fallen California. Indulge yourself in the mastery of the living organism that is the military-industrial complex. 
you skip the side quests, rush through the main campaign. You take a look at the markings covering the map, the hundreds of symbols, arrows, points of interest. As you marvel at the insanity bestowed upon you, you choose the easiest difficulty setting available and get cracking. So why did I choose it, the path of least resistance? A setting by all intents and purposes under my skill level. Well, time. The ticking of the clock. It's always the goddamn ticking of the clock. On higher difficulties, without proper amounts of experience, resource and loot, you get your ass handed to you in no time flat. The games more or less force feed the side content to you, since the main campaign doesn't give you enough to go by. Without exhuming every possibility given by the game to bolster your might, you'll soon find yourself against a sudden brick wall. Only grinding can get you through. But what if you don't want content? What if you don't need more things to do? What if you're not looking to pass the time? Chores to fill and worlds into which escape to? Fetch quests and copy-pasted dungeons tucked between thousands of procedurally generated NPCs and dialogues, each one shot with the exact same two camera shots over and over again. What if you just want to feel? To find something that sticks with you after you put down the controller? In these games the main narrative isn't their strong suit. It's not bad by any means. Hearts of Stone is amazing. Horizon Zero Dawn has a few compelling moments. Even MGS5 had its moments. These games don't excel so much in narrative, or even gameplay, but scope. The thing that makes the Wild Hunt so incredible, so unfathomable, is that there's so much of it. And most of it is pretty decent, even excellent at times. But it's the world that is the star of the show. But if you don't fill your log with quests and treasure hunts and immerse yourself in the world, if you don't engage with the game mechanics by the blessing of the lower difficulty, what do you really have left? When you strip these games from their scope and grandeur, they reveal themselves to be... kinda shallow. And this is not a critique of the games per se, just an observation about the nature of the beast. I daydream that one day I'll replay the Wild Hunt on Death March, complete Horizon Zero Dawn on Survival, and master MGS5 on Legendary. I'll loiter through the groves of the forest and meadows on the hills. I'll remove the HUD. I'll take my time. I'll sneak through enemy camps in search of loot and salvage. I'll walk around the cities and towns, taking in the hustle and bustle. I'll submerge myself into the mechanics of these games instead of spamming my way to victory. I'll hike the mountains of Kaer Morhen, sail the seas of Ard Skellig, carefree, content. The ticking of the clock will fade away. One day, I'm gonna do it right. But the odds are... I'm not. In all likelihood, I'm not going to pour that plus 300 hours into games I've already finished, just in hope of finding some sort of closure with them, some sort of contempt. There's things to do. Dad stuff, relationship stuff, art stuff, strength stuff, and most important, I have a backlog. Tunic, Hyperlight Drifter, Pathogenic 2, Pentiment, Goddamn Elden Ring, Rain World, The Endling, the Suikoden remasters are closing in. Plus, I can scale up the difficulty as much as I like and starve myself of resources all I want, but these games still won't play like I'd wish them to. These games are unwieldable without their little minimaps, their guiding dotted paths, arrows on the screen, the markers and quest signs on the map. You can't maneuver these vast lands without constantly staring at the upper corner of your screen. The carefully curated street signs aren't for reading. The towns and cities boil down to cryptic mazes, points of interest into foreseeable happenstances in the digital wilderness. This huge world amounts to little less than a mere backdrop. It's sad the way these games are crafted and designed makes these worlds that are curated with such devotion and care kind of obsolete. 
No amount of fiddling with damage multipliers can change that. In Nier Automata, you have the choice of four difficulty settings. The names are kind of self-explanatory. Easy is easy, normal is, well, still kinda easy. Hard is hard, and very hard is a fucking nightmare. On easy the game more or less plays itself. On very hard, every enemy hits like a truck filled with lead bricks, and almost anything and everything will one-shot you. And in a game like Nier Automata, where every enemy encounter is comprised of dozens of enemies and hundreds of simultaneous projectiles, the possibilities of getting one shot are near limitless. It is the feel and atmosphere of the game that receive the most dramatic changes as you bump up the difficulty. On easy and normal, you always feel capable and empowered to take the enemies on with grace and elegance. No matter how many dozens of robots the game throws at you, no matter how many hundreds of projectiles plot out the sun, to deal death and righteous fury towards a crude, insect-like foe with ballerina-esque beauty, it's a glorious romp of destruction and massacre for the glory of mankind. You're not just the sword and shield of mankind, you're the sword and even bigger sword. You liberate and reclaim the rusted world back from the swarming sickness of the robot threat. On harder difficulties, near Automata is brutal, extremely so. The feel and tide of the battle are reversed. You are being swarmed, trampled to the ground by an overflowing, overnumbered, overpowered opposition. The mere act of remaining devolves into a constant battle for survival, where you scrape by with the skin of your teeth. The empowerment is gone. You're left with nothing but desperation a growing certainty of the futility of the task at hand. How long can you keep fighting this losing battle against an enemy that is by all accounts endless and omnipresent? If on easier difficulties you're carrying on the torch for humanity, on harder modes you are protecting a lit match from an endless thunderstorm. The once crude, almost adorable, barrel-esque robots reveal themselves a ravenous, hive-minded beast, always just a second away from devouring you. Certain death is just a misstep away, and with the constant barrage of hordes of enemies and swarms of projectiles, you will take that misstep. With a simple change of difficulty, Nier Automata manages to tell two tonally opposite stories. Think for a moment about your favorite tense scene in a horror movie. Alien, The Silence of the Lambs, The Shining, or in my case, The Exorcist 3. A god-awful train wreck of a movie with one brilliant scene hidden amidst all the schlock, the hospital scene. A minute of silence and steady shots broken only by the steps of the nurse doing her rounds. The silence is broken when a hooded figure, clad in white, marches out of the room, carrying a pair of garden scissors. The orchestra has an atonal fit as the blades reach towards the nurse's neck. She, utterly oblivious to her upcoming fate. Just before contact, the movie hard cuts into a shot of a classical marble sculpture. It also seems to have misplaced its head. It's kinda cheap, a jump scare to end all jump scares, but it's damn effective, even when you know it's coming. Now watch that same scene again and again for ten times. No matter how brilliant the scene, it does lose some of its zing, doesn't it? This is the uphill battle many games, especially ones in the horror genre, plow through, often losing. Though compared to their elder brethren, games have interactivity on their side, 
This helps to ward off some of the calcification. You can try different things. Screw up in multiple ways, which introduces variance to the mix. The embodied nature of the experience seems to also stave off some of the creeping staleness. Still, there is a very limited amount of capital the game has to keep you hooked. To keep you interested in going forth. Maintaining engagement can be tricky, but maintaining immersion, that's a damn magic trick. During my original playthrough of Amnesia, a machine for pigs, I died once. Well, twice. But I think only one of them counts. More on that later. When I played through Soma, the, some would argue, the spiritual successor to the Amnesia franchise, I died many, many, many times. These games are, in a way, almost identical. Atmospheric, first-person walking simulator horror experiences where stealth and quick feet are your only solutions to the problem of getting mauled and torn into a pulp by an array of creepy monsters in horrifying scenarios. A Machine for Pigs takes place in Victorian London. Soma is a post-apocalyptic sci-fi tale. A Machine for Pigs has horrifying undead pigmen. Soma has horrifying undead nautical monstrosities. You want to avoid both in equal measures. You do some light puzzling and exploring in the atmosphere-drenched surroundings. Look for a way forward. You try to understand what the hell is going on in the plot, and then you see, hear, or just sense a murderous thingy. Usually it lies in wait just between you and the path where you'd like to go. And so you skulk in the shadows and wait for the danger to pass. Find an alternative route, or just Make a run for it. Hey, you have legs, at least for the time being. Might as well use them before someone chomps them off. Soma is the quote-unquote better one of the two games. The narrative has more depth. The puzzles feel way, way less like inconsequential padding. The level designs are more intricate and the enemy encounters on another level. Compared to a machine for pigs stilted piglets that stumble around the heart of the machine, Soma's monsters have that much more meat to them. They all look different, behave different, move different. They demand different approaches to get by. They have names, backstories, a narrative function. In a machine for pigs, all the encounters more or less boil down to the same scenario. You crouch in the darkness with your lamp shut and wait for the generic pig man to walk by you so you can sneak off or make a run for it. When you hear a screechy sound or the music suddenly tense up, you know it's time to stop sneaking and start running. Except in the penultimate sequence where the game suddenly throws teleporting Tesla coil piggies into the mix. Those guys killed me once and once I fell into a water pool, I just earlier ran electricity through. And that's the death that shouldn't count. Soma is the better game. It dives deeper, reaches farther, pushes further. Yet, despite all this, a machine for pigs hit me much harder than Soma. Yes, Soma has better gameplay, a more fleshed out narrative, tackling deeper subjects with better execution, better, well, everything. But its narrative force and mechanical prowess were dwarfed every time the game kicked me out of the flow, out of the immersion, with a fail state. Every repeated encounter makes the original encounter seem staler. Every repeat takes you more out of the story, out of the world, the experience, the immersion. In the end, you just executes a predetermined set of controls on your controller to conquer a binary fail state to further the sequence. You no longer drench yourself into the experience the devs carefully curated for you. It's not bad by any means, far from it, 
the stellar sound design and visuals help, but seven retries for a sequence is a lot more than one, and one is a hell of a lot more than zero. A Machine for Pigs felt all the time as if I'd just barely managed to scrape by by the skin of my teeth, that it was just a matter of milliseconds I'd managed to escape from the wicked things grasping for my neck in the darkness. When the line between life and death was drawn, I was just, just barely able to haul myself on the better side of that line. A seamless, uninterrupted stream of those tense, near-miss moments. Soma. Not so much. Signalis is one of my favorite releases to come out in the last, well, a very long time. The atmosphere and the visuals are amazing. The VHS futurism meets early Cold War propaganda meets space fascists. A story of a genre very dear to my heart I like to refer to as, what the fuck is going on here? The narrative best described as eldritch by its nature hovers somewhere between a compelling mystery and Lynchian Dada. Despite dozens of nods, easter eggs, rethreads and heavy-handed homages, Signalis manages to find its own identity. It sails the strange shores of retro, nostalgia and WTF with a grace one can but marvel. The devs give you options to decide how retro you want Signalis to feel. CRT filters, warble effects, you can even omit the tank controls and play the game with a modern analog controller scheme, like a sane person would. The world has chosen to move on, and thank God, so can we. Signalis feels unapologetically determined on what type of experience it wants to be, even with these bones the devs throw us. If you've ever played one of the PS1-era survival horror games, you feel right at home with Signalis. Low ammo, low health, low inventory space, cryptic artsy item puzzles, deserted urban areas, residents turned mindless monsters a la Resident Evil, yet they're squiggly, flinchy, squirmy and disturbingly feminine a la Silent Hill. Throw in some cassette futurism a la Alien, some replicant android shenanigans a la Blade Runner, a soundtrack that sounds like Vangelis had a jam session with Akira Yamaoka, and to top it off, throw in some classic anime aesthetics, Neo Genesis Evangelion and Akira. Sprinkle in some Lovecraftian horrors and Lynchian weirdness, and voila, you have something that very much resembles Signalis. This game doesn't do the whole modern trend of like games of the old, but with some quality of life improvements and then some. No. It doubles down on its quirks and digs its heels into the dirt. Signalis is unwavering in its allegiance to the old ways of survival horror. Oh, you thought the red zombies from Resi 1 Remake were bad? Well, what if every enemy in the game wakes up randomly and often, unless you use a very limited item to burn their bodies so they stay down? You think rationing ammo was hard in the old games? Well, how about we litter every goddamn room and hallway of the game with those resurrecting enemies and make them bullet sponges plus make the ammunition incredibly scarce? You thought managing your teeny tiny inventory was challenging in the old days? Well, how about we triple the number of puzzles and the number of items the cryptic artsy item puzzles require to solve? Compared to its ancestors, Signalis intensifies the inherent attributes of the genre. It ramps up the pressure, which then in turn intensifies the horror. Or, at least, that's the working theory. Whatever the reason might be, Signalis manages to pull off the coveted but often missed magic trick of time travel. Throughout solving the game's puzzles and uncovering its secrets, I took notes, drew diagrams, wrote down radio frequencies, on an actual paper with an actual pencil held in my actual fingers. I haven't done that in probably this millennia. The level layouts and puzzle design of Signalis take a fractal sort of form. You have a hub room which holds a locked door and said door demands multiple keys to open. 
from the hub room, you have multiple different routes that crisscross, interconnect and loop back to the problematic locked door. The puzzle rooms are usually found in dead ends, with important key items spread and sprinkled around the adjacent hallways and rooms. By the end game, you'll be juggling doors with six locks, each lock demanding multiple puzzles to acquire the necessary key item, an ever-expanding array of item puzzles nested inside a bigger puzzle, a fractal. Now let's throw into the mix the game's very limited inventory of six slots. Since most of the game is almost pitch black, you'll probably want the flashlight. There are tons of enemies, which many do massive damage, so you might need a weapon and some ammo. If you're quick on your feet and daring, you may omit some of the last line of defense melee weapons, but for crowd control and really tight spots, we'll want something with a bang, like a shotgun. But since it's for emergencies, you'll skip the extra shells. You might want to consider a healing item, since the enemies pack all kinds of punches and you can only save in dedicated save rooms, but since you're daring and quick on your feet, you can omit the healing items. Maybe. This barebones loadout is 5 slots, 5 sixths of your inventory, 4 sixths if you omit the, all the healing items, and half if you omit the flashlight, which renders multiple areas of the game straight out unplayable. This loadout leaves you next to no room to pick any other items you happen upon. No additional ammo, there's at least 5 types of ammo in this game, no health items, no super rare and important flares you need to stop the enemies from resurrecting, no melee weapons, no new weapons, no accessory items. And it's not like you don't need the extra items, you do. Even on normal difficulty, this game hits you hard, and the enemies take something hundred bullets to kill, after which they just get back up. Many, especially the late game puzzles, demand multiple items to solve, and by the end game you're running around the abandoned districts with dozen or more key items. Even if you strip poor Elster from every other vital piece of gear and play in the most optimized way possible, you end up running back and forth multiple times between save rooms and puzzle locations. Should the need arise, you can destroy something from your inventory to make room. Destroy, but not drop to recollect later. The game forces you to choose between losing ground or face the tedium of backtracking. As the puzzles grow more complex and formidable, the game devolves into scavenger runs, puzzle runs and exploration runs. You can't account for the items you need or are going to find. The suspense of exploring the unknown grounds takes an arrow to the knee, since you know, by the time the key items start to pile on, you'll have to zigzag these same corridors round and round. This is a staple of the genre and an homage to the past, Back in the day, we ran around with six inventory slots in Resi 1, and we all had a marvelous time. Presumably. But Resi 1 never had us do open-ended puzzles with dozen key items with those six slots. And thus, it is revealed that Signalis doesn't excel so much in pressure, but tedium. In the end, I ditched my trusted pen and my notebook. I stopped taking notes, drawing diagrams, writing down what I thought was going on. The inventory wore me down. The tedium of the item management wore me down. The corridors of Sepinski wore me down. Somewhere around the halfway mark, I dropped the difficulty to the filthy casual, googled a spoiler-free walkthrough, and finished Signalis with one eye fixed on the walkthrough, the other one on my TV. I can handle difficult. I meditate. I do strength training. I've taken daily cold showers for years. I carry heavy shit around in the forest because I believe doing difficult things elevates your spirit. But this wasn't difficult. This wasn't challenging. This didn't sharpen, heighten, distill or reveal anything to me. There was no removal of the whale. No overcoming of a boundary. There was no transformation. That which was felt just futile on a scale I wasn't willing to deal with. I love this game. The story that hurts your brain and your soul the more you think about it. The king in yellow, pulsating fleshy pits, weird first-person scenes that break the laws of causality and time and space. It's in German, occasionally. How do you top that? Well, 
You don't. You can't. We should just pack our shit and go do something else. We've peaked. But the inventory pulls you away from the vibes, constantly. It forces you to focus on the mechanical minutiae of the game. It doubles, maybe even triples, the game's runtime and offers very little in return. And so Signalis, like many before it, dives headfirst into the pit where Immersion goes to die. It is the unknown that we fear, that beckons us, compels us to move forward. And it is the unknown that is the first to go when games invite us to rethread our steps ad nauseum. The strange hallways, dark corridors, the streets basking in fluorescent are reduced to familiar geometrical shapes through which you maneuver in frugal efficiency. The industrial pounding, the shrill, atonal soundscapes become little more than static. The terrifying monstrosities, their screams and flailing demeanor devolve into a friendly reminder it's time to zigzag and mind your steps. Horror turns into boredom and threat into nuisance. The terrifying adventure morphs into a series of habituated button prompts you execute to get from point A to point B. You're no longer in rot front. Bioresonance no longer transforms and distorts the world through different layers of dream, space and time. The king in yellow ceases to entice you forward. The red eye watches over you no more. Reality shifts and you're once again the middle-aging boy man who sits on his sofa, grasps a controller four hours past proper bedtime. And from underneath the multiple different layers of silence, you can hear the all too familiar ticking of the clock. Difficulty can be a medium for transformation. It can alter how you approach and interact with the game, its gameplay, systems, the flow of the experience. It can reframe the narrative, tilt the atmosphere towards something not present on easier difficulties. And if not implemented well, it can shatter the experience. The way you perceive the world transforms the world you perceive. So, how much tribulation does it take to shatter the fourth wall? Can difficulty change the nature of man? In all of the Soulsborne Ekiro Ring games, difficulty is placed in front and center of the experience. It is the lens which through these games are to be viewed, the language they speak, the only language. There is no difficulty selection. There's no way to dial down the torment. It is what it is. In Mario we jump, in Doom we shoot, in Bloodborne we die. These games are not just difficult, they're oppressing, crushing, obscure, intimidating. At first they seem almost unpenetrable. And the hardships aren't contained just in the gameplay. They spread and spill into the narrative, the atmosphere, into the very ambience these games radiate. The beastly scourge of Yarnam is made that much more intimate, more visceral, when everything beset on your path can and probably will kill you. These beasts are feral, violent, and will tear you to pieces in a matter of seconds. I've never experienced a game with such a palpable aura of violence. Sekiro's world is brutal and harsh, but holds a intriguing elegance within it. I've never played a game that throws you so deep into the deep end from the get-go. These games are fast-paced, relentless in their onslaught, and demand a level of commitment that often feels overwhelming. It's humbling how much you can suck at these games when you begin your journey, regardless of your overall adequacy as a gamer. It's genuinely shocking how far these games are willing to push you, how much effort they require, how great is the sacrifice they demand. And then there's Dark Souls.
For me, the original Dark Souls is still the most unique and interesting one of all the series offerings. The most unique, the most interesting, but not the best. I have a hard time talking about this game since, truth be told, I kinda hate it a bit. A lot, actually. It's janky, broken, horribly paced, unfair, unbalanced and unrivaled in its capability to make me want to curl up into a ball on the floor and cry. It's a game I really, really don't enjoy playing. A game I love and adore, as long as I don't have to actually sit down and play it. Despite this, or perhaps for this exact reason, it's the one Soulsborne game I'm most obsessed with. Perhaps just the game I'm most obsessed with, period. The reason why it still feels so different, even over a decade later, is a little harder to parse together. Why does this game, regardless of how you feel about it, grip you so tight, reach so deep under your skin? There's more grandeur in the later installments, more bombast, bigger, longer, uncut. More enemies, more variety, bigger set pieces, better graphics, incredible moments, more intricate creature design, a more robust and less janky gameplay, more builds to suit more playstyles, more weapons, items, buffs, mechanics and abilities, more enthralling narratives and themes that are executed and used better. Not counting the open, non-linear, interconnected world, there's really not that a lot to miss in the original Dark Souls when compared to everything the sequels offer. The ebb and flow of the combat also feel different. There's more action and aggression in the later games. More agency, more back and forth. There's screaming, flailing, split-second decisions. Encounters that demand timed parries, timed rolls. Intricate sequences that demand specific and precise reactions to conquer. The latter games, with Sekiro spearheading the group, are actually really difficult. In order to see the credits roll, they demand you to do things that are physically challenging to pull off, to deflect, evade and counter 10-hit combos with timing windows that span as little as a couple of frames. The Orphan of Koz is difficult. Sekiro is difficult through and through. Slave Knight Gale is difficult. To best, they demand a great deal of reflexes, knowledge of enemy behavior, attack animations, weaknesses, buffs, intricacies considering builds and strategy, things you need to acclimate yourself with, knowledge you can only gather after many trials and errors, by training, by trying different things out, honing in on different aspects of your gameplay, distilling impurities, sanding off the unnecessary. This is the direction from software has been moving towards for the last decade and a half. Dark Souls feels different. Of course, there are builds, stats, levels, loadouts, strategies, maneuvers, timing, proper action and reaction, the do's and the don'ts. It's a third-person action RPG very much aching to its followers and follow-ups. For a layman, it's, for all intents and purposes, identical. But what makes the original so intriguing is, by design, your utterly ill-equipped to stand a chance against anything the game throws at you. From the moment you set your foot on Lordran soil, you're onslaughted with challenges against which you have no idea how to shield yourself from. The key to conquering Dark Souls, the pathway to getting good, is not so much about how to manage your skill set, but how to manage the breaking of your spirit. How to keep at bay the creeping, gnawing realization of futility, the ticking of the clock. The ultimate quest in Dark Souls, both in gameplay and within the narrative, is to not to go hollow, to not lose the will to go on. The story of Dark Souls is a story of suffering. Yes, there's Lord Run, the undead curse, the legacy of the God King Gwyn and his war against the eternal dragons. There's the linking of the fire, the coming age of dark, and the dark soul of mankind. But that's what the story is, not what the story is about. Lordran is cruel, unfair, desolate, 
in stasis. The kingdom is trapped in a vicious downward spiral, and your only choices are whether to embrace the status quo or walk away from it. And regardless of your choice, it's all bound to happen again. The Age of Grey will never return. There is no going back to the stillness. There is only the Age of Fire, the light, after which comes the dark, after which comes the light, after which comes the dark, till the end of all times. The fire will always fade, but from the midst of the darkness, a new spark will emerge. There is no escape, no way out. This is the despair you're fighting against in Lordran, in Dark Souls. This world is a hostile gauntlet, unending, destined to loop till the end of time, regardless of how strong you become. Why do you go on? Why won't you just embrace the hollowing? The trivialities of your journey will change. Time is a fickle thing in Lordran. You may align yourself with the sun or the dark. You may adorn yourself in robes and pyromancy or cower behind your shield and spear. You may help some, save some, betray some, condemn some. Your route may differ and the order you face the grand ordeal sets upon your path. Do you ring the bell in the tower first or the one far below the depths? Which of the four lords will fall first? The specifics change, but the story remains the same. You will set out for your quest. You will fail over and over again. You will lose your way. You will break and you will lose hope. You will suffer. But with enough will or courage or just plain old stubbornness, you will rise. You will once again find your way and you will overcome that suffering. That is what Dark Souls is about. Through all the unfair seeming and cruel bullshit, the basilisks that curse you, swords that break right when you reach the bottom of goddamn Blight Town, Capra demons that one-shot you within the first second you enter the arena, golden archer knights who snipe you down from the pathways of Anolondo, the stretchy ghost thingies with scythe hands who kill you through walls, that is what lies at the heart of Dark Souls. That's the reason why many find this game so incredibly curative. Why these games have helped people through dark times. They force you to remember that within yourself, at all times, you have the means to not only bear tribulation, but to overcome it. To transform yourself into something more than you were before. And that is what these games, this game more than any other, teaches you. How to suffer how to bear suffering. And since pain is one of, if not the fundamental reality of our existence, that is one hell of a skill to master. What could be a better use of your time 